It's Thursday, December 20th, and you're listening to the Geek at Geek News Central, the longest continuous running tech podcast. This is show number 826, sponsored in part by GoDaddy.com. Geek News Central, proud member of the Tech Podcast Network. Our December special for all new and existing GoDaddy customers, 295.coms. And of course, what we have available as well is we've got a 20% off code by using the promo code go 20 off too. Hey folks, I've got a great show lined up for you tonight. Got a lot to talk about. It's yes, it's Christmas time. Strap in. Here it comes. All right, people, I need a go no go for the Geek News Central podcast. Digital archive recorders. We're go fly. Microphone. We're go fly. Video feed. Go. Web browser. Go. RSS data stream aggregator. Go fly. Interflux totism suppressor. All right. I'm confused. Host readiness check. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. The Geek News Central podcast is a proud member of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are ready to go. Q Todd in. Five. Button, button, who's got the button? Four. There is no cause for alarm. Three. Everybody hold on to something. Two. Just press the button. One. It's showtime. Hello and welcome to Geek News Central, coming to you as live as it can be from the beautiful state of Hawaii via the Geek News Central studio overlooking greater Honolulu. Hey everyone, welcome to the show. My name is Todd Cockburn. Of course, I want to encourage you to get over to geeknewscentral.com. Check out our great content. Got lots going on over there. Our writers have been pretty busy and putting stuff up on the web. So definitely take a chance and come over and, and, and really subscribe to the site and, and follow what's going on so that you can stay abreast of the latest tech news that's happening in the tech space. Uh, we, we try to find the the unusual for you, and we try to find cool stories that aren't necessarily being covered everywhere else. Of course, if you're a longtime listener of the show, I want to thank you for being part of the HANA, being part of the family. Thanks for being subscribed, and uh, hey, thanks for continuing to support the show. It is greatly appreciated. If you're new to the show, you definitely want to get over to the website as well, get signed up for the show where you can subscribe to it, and you'll find that there in the second column of the website, or you can select to the uh, sign up for the newsletter. That'll get you an email directly to your inbox immediately following the show with all of the show notes, all the links of everything that I'm going to cover during the show. If you want to, all the hyperlinks to everything that I'm going to cover tonight, you need to go over to gncshownotes.com. That's the place to go to get uh, all of the uh, links of everything that uh, I'm going to cover during the show tonight. As you can expect, uh, kind of getting ready for Christmas here. Things are kind of slowing down in the tech space. Not a lot of announcements this week, a lot, not a lot of news. A lot of people are on vacation, but I do have some things to go through. Hey, as always, you can reach me here by tweeting me at Geek News. The email address is geeknews at gmail.com or the voicemail hotline is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week at 619-342-7365. Well, I hope everyone's had a, uh, a great week and uh, ready for the holidays. Many of you are probably uh, listening to this in transit to a family member's house or something. We appreciate you tuning in, in and around the Christmas holidays. It's it's appreciated. I tell you what happens is, is uh, leading up to Christmas, the audiences kind of descend and then right after Christmas, everyone's back hot and heavy because they've got new devices and they want to consume the show. So I'm going to encourage you to come back and, and if you get an iPad for Christmas or a Nook or if you get an Android device or whatever it may be, come back and watch the video portion of the show and uh, and check us out that way. Of course, you can watch the show on the Tech Podcast channel on the Roku, Boxy, Samsung Smart TV, Google TV, Apple TV, all those devices. And of course, you can just come to the website as well and watch, which is just as easy. So thanks for being here, everyone. And uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, our sponsor today is GoDaddy.com. And they tell you they've got lots of great products and services. They've been taking care of us here at the show for uh, a number of years. And we got a great t a couple of specials this month, uh, one of them being a $2.95.com. And these, these are going to expire at the end of the month. So if you're looking for 295.coms, you'll want to go over to GoDaddy.com. And when you get to that checkout counter, you're going to want to use the code GEEK, G-E-E-K, 295. And of course, you can find all of my promo codes right on the website at GeekNewsCentral.com. You just scroll down, you'll see the link that says GoDaddy promo codes. And that's going to load a page. It's going to have all my codes there as a code for every occasion. Got a 20% off code, go 20 
off too is a great code to use to get 20% off. We got SSL certificates this month for $4.99. So $499 S four nine nine S S L one. And uh hey, sign up for 10 years and you know get it for 49 bucks. And of course, all the hosting promotion codes and so forth are on the website as well. So geeknewcentral.com forward slash GoDaddy for all of the codes. I want to thank GoDaddy for being a sponsor here at the show, helping us keep the lights on and keep this show uh, moving forward and uh, and uh, keeping the family fed. So let me just talk real quick. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the just the, the admin stuff, but just a couple of quick points. The 24 podcast, uh, I'll start getting those videos up. I haven't had time this week. It's just been purely insane around here. Um, we're still going to be doing the Christmas Eve GNC Insider for all our insiders. It'll be a great recording. We're going to just kind of talk shop, talk story, uh, take some time to do that recording. We'll probably have a number of the family members on and uh, and sharing their sentiments and talking about the show and dad's schedule and everything else. So we hope that you'll take time. And uh, those of you that are insiders, you'll be getting that link on Christmas Eve via email. So keep an eye out for it. If you're not an insider, it's not too late. All you got to do is come over to geeknewcentral.com forward slash insider to get access to that special GNC insider. All you got to do is make a single donation or sign up for the month-to-month support. CES scheduling is continuing. Uh, it's pretty busy. Uh, we've been working. You know, let me see if I can actually show you guys on the screen. I don't know if I can do this easier now. Let me see if I automatically will log in or if it's going to going to yeah, let me see here. I can go over to Google Drive. I can load that up. And let's see here. CES 2013 interview slots. So basically what you see, everything in orange and blue has been booked. White is uh, empty. And uh, so we're, we're making good progress. Um, and I think we're probably about halfway booked, which is really good at this point. I'm, I'm really pleased on uh, where we're at from a, from a booking standpoint. So we continue to move forward here with the uh, with the bookings for for CES. Um, been car shopping, and uh, it's uh, at this point we're just uh, kind of in a holding pattern, but uh, we'll probably make a decision here soon on that. Hey, for those of you that were watching the Twenty Four podcast, you may have saw that we were actually we had a couple of situations where we had some reboots, and. You know, I, I I reached out to the folks at New Tech to find out, you know, what the deal is. And through my research, and, and this is really important, this is really geeky here for those of you that are um, listening, because a lot of these computers now have a PFC sine wave type of um, power supply. The specific thing you want to watch for is if your power supply in your desktop is a PFC type of um, power supply. And when you have a PFC power supply in a computer, which a lot of computers are coming out with now, and which my TriCaster has, especially on workstations that have two um, power supplies, those usually are PFCs, there is a requirement. And, and, it, and what will happen is if you're using a kind of a stand, run-of-the-mill uh, UPS, you're going to end up with um, a syst- uh, UPS that doesn't do pure sine wave output. And what will happen if there's a fluctuation in the power, if you don't have this pure sine wave output, the machine can just automatically uh, reboot. So it's it's not good. You know, it just all of a sudden it just, it, it doesn't really hurt it, but at the same time, you know, you, you don't want a computer to ever reboot on you. So um, talking with uh, a variety of folks, Don Bain and the guys over there, um, we found out about a company called CyberPower, and uh, they have a number of products. Uh, the unit that we got for the studio here was uh, what's called the, uh, it's an OR2200 PFC RT2U, and then the one, <coughs> excuse me, that we're going to use, whoops, Okay, the one that we're going to use for the um, uh, for the show actually going to Vegas is a little desktop version. Um, doesn't won't hold the power as long, but it still has this pure sine wave. So when you're getting ready to buy your next UPS, 
Um, these are much, much better. And a couple of companies make them. Uh, Cyber Power has got a pretty good um, reputation behind them. And uh, I'm telling you, this this thing that we bought that is this this big one, it's, it's a monster. It's like 70 pounds. It's unreal how heavy it is. But uh, that's what's uh, backing up the TriCaster tonight. And hopefully we if, if we have a reboot, we'll know it's not that. It's the box. But um, just a little bit of information for you if you're getting ready to you know, buy a gaming machine that has one of these uh, PFC uh, power supplies in it. Or if you've got a computer that from time to time just, you know, dumps on you and you're not aware of, of why it's uh, it's dumping on you. So um, give you that little heads up. And as you're, you know, doing some shopping and you're geeking out, uh, it's something to keep back in your mind that uh, you're looking for a pure sine wave UPS. And again, not all UPSs, even the most expensive ones, do not have that technology in there. They just, they cost a little more. Not that much more, but they do cost um, a little more. So CyberPower, CyberPowerSystems.com is uh, where I got, and I was uh, shopping in the PFC SineWave series, which is a link within the webpage itself. But I'll put a link up to it in the show notes for you guys to to check out. Um, let's see here. What else? Uh, I think that's it. My Just my kind of short stack of what I wanted to talk about at the beginning of the show. Let me go ahead and load the Chrome up here so that we have the full load for tonight of what we're going to cover. And I, um, of course, you know, tomorrow, <laughs> you know, all the, uh, um, you know, it's a, it's a very ominous date on the calendar. And uh, most of the country is already um, basically on December 21st. The main calendar's uh, rolling over, and of course, the uh, you know there's been lots of discussion about what's been going on in the space. So there's all kinds of uh, articles that have been popping up today on preppers and a variety of different uh, uh, things that have been going on. With you know, there's all there's lots of stuff going on, on the net in in relation to this calendar rollover that I think is kind of funny. But the one thing I really found that I was pretty um, shocked about was a specific company that has never came across the radar for me and uh the first time i um i really kind of had an exposure to them was tonight so let's see if i can load up their their main website without the video beginning to play um it's vivos v-i-v-o-s dot com v-i-v-o-s dot com and um so let's see here is it gonna is it gonna load oops what did i did i type it wrong uh, maybe it's not V-I-V-O-S. So let me do a quick search. V-I-V-O-S. And, oh, it's Terra Vivos. That's the company. There we go. So let me stop this from playing so it, it doesn't show up here. But Terra Vivos is a company that basically makes survival shelters, underground shelter network for long-time sur- survival of future uh, catastrophes. And this is... um. They sell private uh, systems, or you can buy into uh, shelters for as many as a thousand people. And the website over at motherboard.vice.com had a pretty significant article about these folks. And uh, you see a lot of these uh, prepper uh, um, shows and stuff, but they've actually got a video or their stuff. They've got, I guess, they got some shelters in Indiana someplace buried. And they're very significant from a um, construction standpoint. And you guys, you guys got to check the video out. But um, I thought today being the day, um, we can all have a little bit of a smile and chuckle. But, um, you know, if you're thinking about, uh, if, you're, if you're prepping and uh, can't afford to build your own, you might be able to rent to own one of these type of uh, systems where you're actually locked down with a variety of people. And, uh, you know, I think the thing about these type of companies is that as soon as the crap really does hit the fan and people that own the um uh you know own spots in those particular shelters you know the word's going to get out and if you know and these are going to be locations where people are going to probably attempt to uh to dig into or you know I'm sure they're going to have sort of some their own set a form of defense but at the same time um you know, I think that uh, you're going to have uh, these types of uh, things are going to be overrun. 
uh, at least by people in a local neighborhood that may know where something's located. It's kind of hard to keep something like this completely quiet, especially when you're bringing people in and giving them tours of facilities. But the one they have in Indiana, they actually, it's in lockdown mode. And, um, and when someone, it takes two people, two separate people with two separate keys. So I guess what they assume They assume if something of a major catastrophe happens that you're going to show up there with your key and one other fellow resident is going to show up with their key and the two of you together will decide to open the shelter. And when it does, the systems come online automatically, generators start, lights come on. It's basically a full automated, um, gets the site up and running. And um, so they don't tell their members, hey, you you know, you, you only open the site if you really need to. Uh, from a cost perspective, but um, they're building these across the country and people are actually paying into these like life assurance. And I I think it's just pretty incredible what they're doing. Um, And uh, this guy uh, doesn't seem to be too much of a crackpot, Um, but uh, in the 1980s, he says he was inspired by a powerful message in which uh, he was told that he needed to prepare. So it was kind of like this Moses moment, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, build the ark. So in long story short here, um, the uh, this guy has uh, built these, and then people are buying into his systems, and it's not cheap. Uh, let me look and see what the cost is. I thought somewhere around $85,000. So, there is one that's located somewhere in western Indiana. It's fully stocked and ready to go. Um, and let's see how much. They're nuclear blast-proof hard bunkers. And uh, they basically, um, it's like 85. So if you want to buy in standard rooms in the Indiana shelter, are outfitted with two bunk beds to hold four people with access to shared bathrooms. Spots there are still available for 50000 per adult, 35000 for children. Before it opened, spaces were 35000 per adult. Still the going price at the bigger shelters that aren't ready yet. And then one of the more luxurious accommodations have their own bathrooms and common spaces and go up to $85,000 a person. And if you look at this video tour that I'm talking about, uh, the Indiana location loo- includes uh, common areas, amenities like a home theater, uh, leather recorders, dining rooms, multi-user kitchen, a laundry mat. Um, so, you know, and they say they've got these things stocked for a full year of occupation by all of the residents. And, uh, but uh, he did say, he would not elaborate on how exactly the fortresses were armed, but he emphasized that they were equipped for not offensive, but defensive measures. So that means that uh, um, if, if someone tries to get into the compound that's not supposed to be there, um, it's not going to be a pretty situation. So anyway, I just thought I would share that, being this is uh, the day. <laughs> and I think he said they're actually opening the shelters, not necessarily because of the main calendar, but maybe just as a good exercise to uh, to test how the system's out and everything. So I just I just thought it was cool. And uh, thought I would share it up with you. Another thing, too, is NASA has, you know, spent a lot of time debunking December 21st. And um, there's another video that's available that actually has NASA talking about this. And, uh, you know, so, you know, this is uh, the last day. And uh, we'll see what date they pick next. But, uh, you know, this, this date on the calendar has been looming a long, long, long time. Uh, but you know we're not through the twenty first yet. We have to we have to get through here. So, you know, I guess uh, Hawaii will be one of the last uh, states to uh, roll off the the calendar for the December twenty first. So we will probably uh, uh, you know you guys can can check in here about uh, midnight Honolulu Standard Time tomorrow and uh, see if we're well. You guys well we'll see if we're all still here. <laughs> um. We got pawned pretty hard at Geek News Central along with a bunch of other sites as well. Um, you guys heard about this Golden Eagle, and that, that should have been the tip-off, the Golden Eagle. Um, basically, there was a video that was put on the Internet that really made the rounds in, in a big, big way. 
where it showed this um, eagle, golden eagle, snatching this kid. And uh, they did a really good job um, with the video. And they got over 8,000 comments and uh, on the website, but it was definitely a, 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 a fake. But uh, basically, if you haven't seen it, you'll have to come over to Geek News Central and, and watch it. But uh, yeah, we got sucked in just like a whole bunch of other people. It looks very convincing. It really does. And they did, they did a great job. So um, it just goes to show you, not everything you see is, is not necessarily exactly what happens. Hey, I want to talk just a little bit here. Um, a couple of posts this week have intrigued me and, and really got me to thinking a little bit. I, I want to take a little time and uh, cozy up to the mic here and, and, and talk about this a little bit. And I'd actually put something up on Facebook and also on Google+, Plus, which I had to kind of laugh because I was kind of busting on those services myself. But Anil Dash um, wrote a blog post uh, on December 13th, and it's entitled The Web We Lost. And for those of you that have been around and on the web uh, basically from the beginning, really know and understand where we've come in the amount of time that we've come and how the web has changed. And if you really think about it, the days of uh, having a modern browser and all the things that we do, it's really not from a time perspective, um, haven't, hasn't been that long. Now, when I was, um, when I moved to Maryland and I had my bulletin board, where people are still dialing into a BBS system, the uh, you know the the web was uh, really kind of just starting to kick off about 1994, and we were really starting to see people being able to dial in and do surfing, and it was starting to grow uh, very very quickly. Well, it didn't take too long, and everyone had a website, and, and there was lots of money being spent in web development. You had lots of different uh, for a better word, a lot of different uh, sites you could go to and do things. And here's, you know, if you think about it, five years ago, um, and this is, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase some of the things that Ano says in his in his blog post. He says, five years ago, uh, most social photos were uploaded to Flickr where they could be tagged by humans or even by apps and services using machine tags. The images were easily discoverable on the public web using simple RSS feeds. If you think about a decade ago, Technorati let you search most of the social web in real time, though the search tended to be awfully slow in presenting results with tags that worked as hashtags do on Twitter today. Um, so 10 years ago, you could, you basically could allow people to post links on your site or to show a list of links, which were driving inbound tra traffic to your site, but you know, Google hadn't broadly introduced AdWords and AdSense, and links weren't about generating revenue. They were a tool for expressing and doing editor editorializing. You know, so and it was a very, very different place. And, uh, you know, in 2003, if you had introduced a single sign-in service that was run by a company, even if you documented the protocol and engaged, encouraged others to clone the service, you'd be described as in introducing a tracking system. Um, and if you back up further in the early part of the century, if you made a service that let users create or share content, the expectation was that they could easily download a full fidelity copy of their data or import that data into other competitive services with no restrictions. Vendors spent years working on interoperability around data exchange purely for the benefit of their users, despite theoretically lowering the barrier of entry for comp competitors. So... Again, going back just five years ago, if you wanted to show content from one site or app on your own site or app, you would you could simply use a document format to do so without requiring a business business development deal or contractual agreement between the sites. The user experience wasn't subject to the the vagaries of political battles between different companies, but instead were consistently based on the extensible architecture of the web itself. So what we've got now is we've got a web where a lot of people are going to Facebook, they're going to Twitter, they're going to Instagram, they're going to Google+. Plus, They're going into these ecosystems and, you know, they're spending years there putting their brand, putting their pictures, putting everything in there. And that data 
at a moment's notice could be unaccessible from another service. You look at what Instagram did for those, you know, besides their terms of service issue, which we'll talk about, but you look at Instagram, they have, you know, basically the, a war has developed between them and Twitter. For those of you who are integrating Instagram with Twitter, you now you, you it doesn't work anymore. It's broke. And it's just because of the, the competitive spirit of the web. And, you know, this would have never happened 10 years ago. There would have been this, you know, this, this cross working together. So what we have right now is, is a, a seriously a significant number of verticals that are self-contained and they do their doggone best to keep you from going anywhere else. I have to applaud Twitter for allowing folks to pull out their, their tweet history. And actually we'll talk about um, Dave Weiner when he's going to be doing some some testing to see if he can uh, liberate some of this data that's been in Twitter. But, you know, I think what we really need to think about is we need to think about where we go from here. You know, some folks are going to really be locked into the services that they're using. And I'm not saying there's not a place for Facebook and Twitter and for uh, Google+. Plus. I think there's a lot of uh, great... Um, uh, opportunity there to, you know, to really to, to do some cool things. And how come I can't click you? You get this stupid thing. I've actually got a, an article that I'm trying to bring up and it's, it doesn't want to come up every time I click. Okay, so I'll kill you. There we go. So there is a um, follow on post that Anal did on, um, Anal Dash did on the 18th talking about rebuilding the web we lost. And he's basically saying we all need to take responsibility and accept blame, accept blame. And he goes on to say in this, the biggest reason the social web drifted from many of the core values of that early era was the insularity and arrogance of many of us who created the tools of the time. And um, we took it as self-evident and obvious that the goal that people would even want to participate in the media instead of doing the hard work necessary to make it a welcoming, rewarding place for the rest of the world. We favored an obscure, obscure um, basically is, is a battle about technical minutia over the hard humbling of gauging a billion people in, a, in connecting online and setting the stage for billions to come. So basically what they're said here is, you know, we did it to ourselves and he, he gets really in deep here in, in his commentary, but you know, I think we all have to think about the fundamentals of the web and, you know, do we want to be controlled by the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world and the Googles of the world and the, and, and the, and the tweets of the world? Do we want to be locked into these spaces or do we want to create public spaces that are truly, truly public? Um, you know, that's some of the things that we've tried to do with the uh, you know, some of the, the tweet clones is to build open spaces, but it's very hard to get, um, you know, enough traction to make it, uh, you know, to where you can grow a, a truly large open space. You know, as a content creator, and I think I've, I've said this many times, any of you that listen to the 24 hour podcast, was I was um, really um, from the very beginning when I started the show. You know, I was really concerned about keeping my brand. Everyone knows where my website is. I don't have to, you know, have them, um, you know, they, they know where to come. And it's for years the site's been at the same location on the same domain. And while well, at the same time, we use Facebook and we use Twitter and we use Google Plus to supplement that message going out to maybe where you're hanging out right now to get the word out about new content you know, really is not doing a great deal to help build Geek News Central, uh, uh, build its uh, volume of, of traffic and so forth because, you know, we're trying to go out to these fringe areas where everyone's at and, and try to be all things to all people. And ultimately, you know, we don't own that. You know, we are, we're basically the product. And, and some people hate that term. It's being used a lot right now. But, um, you know, just like anything else, if you don't pay for something, they got to find a way to pay for it, and it's by mining your data, you know, selling ads to you and so forth. Now, this show could, you know, justifiably could say that you guys 
are the product. But, you know, I don't want to take it that far, and maybe I'm being hypocritical and not doing so, but hopefully you guys value the product that I put out and are worth to, you know, and you, you guys have shown years and years and month after month that you support our sponsors and so forth. But really, ultimately, you know, the goal that I was trying to and have been trying to build with Geek New Central was to, you know, by the Insider Program, little by little transition to a different model uh, for the show. And that's, you know, that's easier said than, than done. But I think all of us should really think about where we're at, where we're putting our media, where we're putting our conversations. And do we really want to be locked into a service that could make it very difficult to get that media out? How long has it taken us to get the media out of out of Twitter? It's taken us years to get our, our archives out of there. And finally, that they're now available and they're limited rollout, but it'll eventually everyone have access to it. So what do we do with that data? Is that data even important? You know, is it important that uh, three years ago I talked about, uh, you know, my dog or something like that? Maybe not, but at least we have access to this and it can go up and maybe exported and put into a public space. And, um, you know, with folks not willing to inter cooperate you're going to continue to have all of these, um, you know, stacked verticals that all have their do they do their thing very well, but they, you know, because of competition and money and everything else, they don't play well together, thus making the user uh, experience um, really bad. And one thing I want to say is, you know, too, and I, and I agree with Anal in his commentary. He says, "Don't trust the trade press," and. You know, what we find when we go to, like, go to CES, we find most of the trade press goes to the trade, base of the press room, pulls press releases, and write their copy at, over a couple of days, and generally do not get out and actually look at the floor. There's a certain level of people that do, and maybe they're directly going to one or two companies, but you don't see people wandering the hall looking for content and looking for the guy with there with a card table that's, uh, you know, got his credit card maxed out. So the trade press itself, many times, you know, I get pre-written articles sent to me um, that they want me to put right on my website. And often I just, I you know, well, always, because I don't ever repost something like that, is that we delete it. And um, so I think the first start for all of us to really consider is maybe it's time that we try to regenerate both the blogging space and, and work on ideas on how we're going to interact together as a community instead of, you know, putting all our data and all of our time into, into Facebook. It's good. It serves its purpose for what it is. But do you really want all your media and stuff locked up there? Maybe some of you, the answer is yes. I don't know. But uh, I'm going to have the link up to these two articles in my show notes. I'd love to have you guys go read them and then, you know, give me your assessment of where we are and how the web was lost, and number two, how we rebuild the web that we've lost. At least I agree in large part to everything Anal Dash has to say in his piece here. Um, so, you know, with rebuilding the web, we have to be able to, I guess for a better word, come up with some ideas uh, on which way we want to go next, where we want to take this as a as a community, and I'm not talking about just this show, the podcast, the blogging, the everything that is truly part of the, the public web now that's not controlled and owned by, you know, a major multimedia company with a billion dollars in, in the bank. So I hope you guys follow my point here on this. Love to hear you guys' feedback on this, but uh, isn't it time to, to rebuild the web and, and do these cool interactive things that we were able to do before? But uh, not so much anymore because of, of competition. And there's this isn't this is fraught with challenges because everyone has an agenda. Everyone wants control. We have to understand that. But uh, we will see where this goes. As I said earlier, Dave Weiner is trying to get folks to share their uh, Twitter archives, and uh, so we'll see where this goes and if they've uh, what Dave comes up with. And Dave's all about open public, and uh, he says a lot of crazy things I don't necessarily agree with. Um, you know, what comes out of his mouth. But number, the one thing I will say about him, he's all about the web, his brand, controlling and keeping it open and, and accessible. So uh, 
We'll see where this goes with uh, what Dave's trying to do. Hey, Roku has round out its uh, media arsenal with a new uh, app from Spotify and Vivo channels. So this is pretty cool. Uh, you know, first up was the news that Vivo is coming to the set-top box, bringing video and music streaming along with its recommendation services. Users will be able to sync their Vivo accounts to access, save videos and playlists. And, of course, Spotify is going to be coming as well. And this is really, really good. And it's going to be available for um, U.S. and U.K. and Ireland users. And to, to most um, Roku's that are on the market, it'll be available in early 2013. So uh, this is awesome. And it uh, fits in if you've got a Spotify account or if you have a Vivo, basically using a Vivo channel. Talked a little earlier in the show about Instagram and some of the stuff that's been going on with them. And boy, oh boy, you know, they, they really torqued off their users. And talk, talking to my daughter about this a little bit, and to her, it's, you know, it's kind of like, I don't care. You know, she has a different uh, perspective when it comes to, um, you know, the property of their media. And so, you know, we, we talked about that a little bit. And I tried to explain to her the concerns I had on the ter- changes of terms of service. But they're going to roll their terms of service back to the previous version, and they're going to take some time to basically look at uh, what they're uh, what they're going to introduce next. Um, they really got, and I'm sure they had a lot of people bail from using the service based on some of the things they announced. It was this is probably the quickest rollback that I've ever seen. You know, usually a company takes some lumps. They make some comments, some minor changes, but they leave the majority of the terms of service in place. This is the first time that I can remember in a long time where they are just rolling the uh, terms back um, stock, lock, stock, and barrel. And uh, saying it's a good thing because some of the stuff that they had in the, in the previous terms of service were were nuts. All right, the ICANN, switching gears here, the ICANN has uh, list the first custom TLDs up for consideration. It's going to start with a Chinese word for Catholic, and it's uh, kind of an interesting thing because I'm looking at this list, and the first 10 are either Chinese, uh, Japanese kanji. Um, there is some, uh, uh, I can see, it looks like, uh, oh boy, I don't know what the actual designation of the, it's basically the, the written word for the, the Middle East. Uh, some Arabic. Um, so basically, what they did is they did a draw. There was 1,930 domains that were essentially um, people had been applied for. And how they determined the pecking order on who's going to get looked at first is they did a random drawing. So the only thing I don't even see in the, there was a couple of Chinese, Russian, Japanese, but they're mostly foreign uh, TLDs. They're at least in the first 10. So to be curious to see where this goes. There is a full list available, but it is kind of funny that the uh, the first TLD being considered is Catholic in uh, in Chinese. And uh, this is a domain that's been registered by the Catholic Church uh, Pontifical Council for Social Communications. So uh, we'll see where this goes. Actually, the Catholic Church has an amazing social media presence they have a, a they know how to create media in a big way because they have to put it out in so many different languages so uh, you know when the catholic church goes big they go big they you know definitely have lots of money behind them kind of an interesting experience going on over in facebook facebook is going to let uh, select users pay to have messages routed directly to a sta- stranger's inbox this is kind of an interesting move, and that one that kind of makes me uh, roll my nose. And, you know, I sometimes you want to reach someone, but I don't know if I'd be willing to pay a buck. And if that person may be irritated if you're not friends with them. They say, how did he email me? And then you, you, you would uh, basically, you know, waste your money doing so and in the process upset someone. And I always try to get an uh, inter- introduction when I'm trying to meet someone on Facebook or LinkedIn or in these sites. But it is curious that Facebook is thinking about letting users pay to have a message routed directly to a stranger's inbox. I think it's just a little odd, but I'm sure they're doing some sort of volume play. It'll be curious to see where the rules on this fall out and how it, uh, you know, what, how it develops. 
Well, this is a first. Pop Charger refunds its Kickstarter funds after hitting Apple rejection. Uh, Kickstarter po- Project Pop, which raised a huge amount of money, $139,000. Um, basically, they re- they're returning their money to all the people that uh, was involved in their Kickstarter campaign. Largely because of um, Apple basically didn't want the this charger be able to charge multiple devices, including um, iPad one, two, and third generation with the old charging um, receptacle to the new one to the to the new Lightning charger. They only wanted the uh, the device to be able to charge devices that use the Lightning. Uh, lightning plug so it really kind of destroyed the uh, idea behind pop because really what they were doing there is it was an all-in-one charger that would charge four or five um, four or five different uh, uh, devices um, at the same time there was something I was going to talk to you guys about let me see if I can find this if I and it goes oh what it goes along with let me see if I can find this in my email real quick. Oh, yeah, here it is. I had uh, been, uh, I participated in a Kickstarter for um, something called Watt Vision. And let me, for those of you that are watching, let me bring this up and let me show you what I um, invested in. Because it's been a long time coming. And I'll show you guys this. What it is, is if you don't have a smart home, or a smart meter, or your smart meter doesn't call home to mama and tell you what kind of energy you're using on an hour-to-hour, day-to-day basis, Watt Vision is going to, um, basically, it's going. it's got some sensors that goes on, doesn't penetrate your meter, but it's got some sensors that basically will track your energy use. And it's going to alert you on your phone. This thing is really, really slick. Um, so what's, what happens here is the Watt Vision hardware and software fully integrated. So the setup process is really, really easy. All you need is a wireless internet connection and, uh, and access to your power meter, and you can perform the installation yourself. And So this is really exciting stuff, and I can't wait to get this. They've asked me for my meter type. I have to go out and take a picture of my meter and then they're going to send me my uh, my sensor. So what it's going to really do here is I'm going to be able to see on an hour-to-hour basis what's going on with my power, how it's being consumed when we peak out. They basically give me the the tools I need to to save some money um, from my uh, power bill. So I'm really looking forward to this. And it'll remind us when we've left something turned on or something to that effect. So I invested $175 on that Kickstarter, and I, I, I'm really excited to, uh, to basically uh, get my kit, and then we'll be able to talk about it here um, on the show and how it worked. All right, next article. Um, there is a new um, Android boy, uh, Android, Android-based Cloud TV box. It's actually called the Cloud TV box. It's from a company called SunGale, and... Um, it uses a dedicated TV UI, uh, which is kind of an interesting move. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of information on the SunGale website. But it is a device that's based on Android and much like Google TV. The uh, Again, the UI and functionality are quite different. So um, this is pretty cool, pretty cool little device. I haven't seen this before, so I spent some time watching the video on cord cutters over at GigaOM. So I have the link up in the show notes for you to check that out. But another little device is always good, um, especially when it comes to being able to get access to uh, media with a set-top box. All right, Hulu's got some challenges. Uh, you know, as Amazon and Netflix uh, really kind of ballot out for dominance in online video, um, the folks over at Hulu, basically, which is Hollywood's own online video service, is under some serious pressure here on which direction to go. The uh, chief executive Hulu has asked the site owners, Walt Disney, uh, Comcast, and News Corp for an additional $200 million to fund more program purchases and an overseas expansion. And uh, this is really about twice the amount of money they can, that those companies contributed this year. 
So we'll see where this goes. It's, it's not known how much these companies are going to kick in, but uh, they're asking for not an insignificant amount of money, $200 million. Now, Hulu had to borrow $338 million in October to finance the $200 million buyout of Providence Equity Partners, a 10%, 10% stake in the venture, and $134 million equity compensation payout to the employees. So, you know, Hulu has invested more than $500 million in content since 2012. But uh, we'll see. We'll see this where, where this goes. We know that uh, there's been tension in the Hulu space by the content owners. Um, you know, subscribers pay 79 Well, how much they pay on Hulu. I can't remember what the subscription fee is. Uh, we have one, and uh, and we use it. But uh, I tell you, that 79-year prime account is a lot better value from Amazon than the Hulu uh, premium account. So let's switch gears here completely. And um, I want to talk about a new bill. Uh, <laughs> I don't think the Congress is doing any type of bills. I think they're just arguing. But um, basically, there's a, a new bill being introduced that um, basically addresses data caps. And basically, the, bills, the bill is basically preventing manufacturers or, or companies or ISPs um, from actually throttling bandwidth. They're saying that metering is only going to be used for congestion control and uh, they're going to have some a law in place where there is a um, basically if they feel there's a discriminatory <laughs> data cap, it's going to get banned. So this is being done by um, Senator Ron Wyden, Democrat of Oregon who has introduced this legislation to, again, to regulate the use of data caps. Um, he says data caps create challenges for consumers and run the risk of undermining innovation in the digital economy if they are imposed bluntly and not designed to truly manage network congestion. So he goes on to say that, it, that he hopes to address three issues with the proposal. First, he wants to increase the amount of accuracy of information provided to consumers. So this bill empowers the FCC to regulate ISP methods for measuring bandwidth with an eye to improving their accuracy, and it requires ISPs to provide their customers with real-time tools for tracking their usage and comparing them with the ISP's established caps. The bill, Second, the bill requires that any data caps employed by ISPs function to reasonably limit network conjunction without necessarily uh, restricting Internet use. And um, the most ambitious part of the legislation is a kind of network neutrality rule. It requires that any data cap, which is defined to include metering schemes, not be used to provide preferential treatment to data that is based on the source or content of the data. In other words, this, this would ban a practice that is frequently mentioned by advocates of net, network neutrality where they have this fast lane and they're filtering peer-to-peer -peer and that kind of stuff. So we'll see where this goes. I think this is going to have uh, challenges. Um, you know, if the Republicans who are in the House may be skeptical of this proposal and it may not make it forward, but it is nice that at least the dia dialogue is starting and that's what's needed. And if, over time, maybe we'll whittle away and be able to get something through. Hey, there's a fascinating article over on Ars Technica talking about behind the closed door of the UN attempted takeover of the internet. And I'm not going to read this. This has really uh, got a lot of uh, picky details. But um, one of the writers over there, L.I. Dorado, who is a research fellow with the Technology Policy Point program at Mercatus Center at George Washington University um, and co-founder of WCIT Leaks and a member of the U.S. delegation to WCIT, uh, WCIT basically talks about his experience of going and what was discussed and how the process went and how the United States and I think 59 other countries ultimately walked away from the uh, the treaty that was being put together over the 12 or 13 day period that they were in Dubai. So I have that link up in the show notes for you to uh, to review. It's a really, I, I've read it. Um, it's it's a really good, really good read and worth, worth your time, the 10 minutes or so it's going to take you to get through it. Hey, iOS 6.02 update has been released uh, this week, and it's cured many people's Wi-Fi woes, but it appears now that it may be reducing battery life. Um, so we will see where this goes. But some folks are complaining about uh, their batteries dying faster 
Um, we'll have to see where this uh, where this leads, but at least that's the rumor on the street. I haven't had no problems with my Wi-Fi, so I'm going to hold off upgrading for a few days. Hey, those of you the system administrators out there, you're going to want to read this article. It's about an Apache plugin that turns legit sites into bank attack platforms. And uh, you definitely want to look at this. It's a root kit that goes on um, Linux machines, and it does a lot of really significant damage to amount of traffic and what's going on with your website. So uh, definitely, I'm going to have that up for you. Those of you that are assist admins, you need to, to read this. Hey, congratulations to the folks over at uh, Virgin uh, Galactic. Uh, they had a flight today that... Um, Let's see if I can bring this up for those of you that are actually watching. Their Spaceship 2 had completed its first uh, glide in the powered flight configuration. So they didn't fire the engine. They just had the motor on. And uh, that's pretty cool. So this was the first uh, time with rocket major components installed, including tanks. It was also the first flight with the thermal protection applied to the spacecraft's leading edges. And uh, it followed an equally successful test flight last Friday, uh, which saw Spaceship 2 flying this configuration but remained mated to its White Knight 2 uh, carrier aircraft. So um, we will see where they go with this. And for those of you that haven't seen it, this is what, uh, what Spaceship 2 looks like. And uh, very cool to see that these tests are continuing. And congratulations to Virgin Galactic as they continue down uh, this road for... Uh, Basically, tourism in space. Hey, if you've been, if you're a big fan of Redbox Instant, or if you want to get access, if you're if you're a fan of Redbox and you want access to Redbox Instant, uh, which is of course they're working with Verizon, um, they're opening up uh, signups for private beta access. So this is big, and of course their service is going to cost eight bucks a month, uh, which is uh, what. Uh, Netflix and Hulu uh, already charge for those services. And uh, Redbox is also going to be offering a various service tiers for customers wishing to utilize the physical Redbox kiosk as well. But uh, apparently they are, uh, they do have some private betas available. I'll have the link in the show notes for you to, to check that out. All right, many of you are going to get an iPad for the first time or maybe a family member that's going to get an iPad mini for the first time. Um, definitely take some time. I'll have a link up here to an article in CNET that is entitled, You Got an iPad, Now What? So I'll have that link up in the show notes for you to, to uh, go through. Uh, some great tips and tricks in there for a, a new iPad uh, winner or uh, someone that's gotten one for a Christmas present. There's an article over on CNET talking about 139 startups are going to be at CES 2013. And there's a robot maker gadget that uh, basically um, it's a device that puts out smell. And what they're going to do is it's going to take gaming to another level. And um, so they're working on this, you know, basically smelly vision. And uh, so they're, they're going to try to uh, make uh, games uh, smell the way they would if you were actually in a, real world versus a virtual world and uh but anyway this uh, device will be showed off at ces it can plug into a computer via usb or work wirelessly so this could be kind of cool we'll see what happens with this and uh i'd be curious to see how this smells really smell and we'll, we'll definitely uh, get a demo for this one at the show uh, so a lot of cool stuff going on all right remember that windows executive um that was bounced uh steven and I just, I destroy his name. So Sanoski, which was uh, the head of the Windows group, uh, he is now going to be teaching at Harvard. So, uh, you know, he goes from working at Microsoft to teaching at Harvard. Uh, but pretty slick deal there. Um, and obviously, he probably didn't need the money, but uh, he's going to go uh, teach, which is kind of cool. Now, he'd been at the Harvard Business School uh, before. Um, back in 98, he was a visiting scholar at the Boston School, and uh, so this is uh, this is an interesting move. He's basically uh, going to go back and teach, which will be great for uh, uh, students who are going to get his classes at Harvard. All right, USPTO has questioned another Apple patent in the fight with Samsung. The USPTO has tentatively rejected um, 
one of the patents that uh, Apple used against Samsung in their $1 billion infringement lawsuit. So the USB2 announced in a later December, dated on December 19th, that they had tentatively rejected all 21 claims of U.S. patents, 7,844,915,000. But basically, the application programming interface for scrolling operations, also known as a 915 patent. This is squeezing, rolling, and the stuff that you can do with uh, a couple of fingers. Um, That patent is uh, apparently going to be tossed. Um, so we'll see where this goes. They've got an appeal process I have to go through, but uh, uh, Apple could end up losing this, which would really impact them in a big way as far as their uh, judgment and damages that they're going to get out of Samsung. There's an article over on NewScientist.com. You ever think about what our hands were used for, how they developed over time, uh, from the time of uh, medieval times all the way back to you know, essentially the Stone Age? Well, it says the human hands evolved so we could punch each other. (laughs) So that's kind of an interesting uh, deduction there. Um, I would think so we could eat and manipulate stuff, but no, the scientists are saying that it was largely uh, so we could uh, punch each other. (laughs) Oh, evil lot we are. Um, iOS 6 adoption is uh, soaring following Google Map release. Uh, reinstating the Google Map on iOS has been uh, enough for some users that have finally made the upgrade to iOS 6. So that's a huge. Um, they're reporting a 13% increase in iOS 6 users from last Monday to Wednesday alone. So uh, that means a lot of people were just holding off and not upgrading their uh, phones to the new operating system, largely because of the uh, the crappy apps that uh, crappy maps that Apple had put out. All right. Um, over on the New Media Journal, there's an article about hackers stealing data from Pentagon, NASA, and Federal Reserve. Apparently, a member of his anonymous affiliated with the team Goshell Hacking Collective have published what they claim is stolen information for 1.6 million accounts linked to government agencies, including the Pentagon, NASA, and Federal Reserve. The hackers appear to have breached the database with a malicious SQL code injection. ZDNet reported stealing passwords and corresponding email addresses, phone numbers, home address, and notes from defense tests. So um, that's huge, really huge, um, that if they got in and actually were able to hack the Pentagon, NASA, or the Federal Reserve, it's, it's uh, scary. So anyway, we will see um, where this goes. All right, a little punchy tonight for some reason. Um, I guess it's the holiday time. Hey, the most remote workplace on earth, uh, pretty incredible. Um, The French-Italian Concordia Station in Antarctica is uh, 370 miles away from its closest other lab. And uh, these guys and and gals that go out there spend a year to 18 months out there, which is a long time to be out in the middle of the ice. But uh, they have uh, really been able to do a lot of cool science. And uh, um, the one scientist been out there says the darkness has a, of course, when it's, you know, it gets dark and stays dark. It says the darkness has a habit of sucking the motivation out of even the hardiest. But the, despite the darkness can have on sleep, mood, and cognitive performance, there's something inherently special about the Antarctic night. And he says, the heavens prevent a view that many stargazers can only ever dream of. You just have to try and catch a glimpse of the stars before your eyelashes freeze together at minus 85 <laughs> degrees Fahrenheit. So uh, anyway, very cool article about this most remote place on Earth. There's a, a crew on the way to the International Space Station. The Soyuz TMA-07M rocket launcher from Balkanor Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan on Wednesday. So uh, they're on their way to the International Space Station and should be docking on Friday. So very, very cool. They're on their way up. No problem so far. And this is an interesting article I found too. Florida, it's considering launching an online-only public university. Uh, This is huge. Uh, Florida House Speaker Will Weatherford, Republican, has petitioned the State Board of Governors to examine the possibility of launching an online-only 
public university as a means of aiding would-be students who are unable to attend school full-time and increase distant learning attendance. Wow, this, this, is, uh, this is big. Now, some of the education professionals are skeptical. Of course, they're going to say that because, you know, when you go digital, you don't need as many teachers. You don't need all that extra infrastructure. But um, this would be very, very cool. If, if you bring an online school on board and you have all 700 college courses available at 39 colleges and universities in the state of Florida, this is, would be huge. Um, so we'll see. But the, univer- the legislatures are moving forward. And uh, so they're going to have a little time to come up with a counterproposal. But I'm hoping that this happens. This would be big. It really, really would. They're still going to collect tuition. Don't get me wrong. But uh, I think digital is really a, a great way to go, especially if you have this great institutionalized uh, uh, college that uh, is going to be the one giving you your degree. You know, it's it'll be cool. It really will. Hey, over on Lifehacker, they got the most popular iPhone and, and uh, iPad apps. So I've got these linked up in the show notes for you, a whole variety of different posts on different apps and stuff that they covered over the past year. So that link will be up in the show notes for you to check out. There's also some tax advice with the looming uh, fiscal cliff. If the if we do fall over the fiscal cliff and everyone's taxes goes up, you know, I'm, sh- I'm sure what's going to happen is what the taxes will go up and the president will come in behind and, and re-lower them again and uh, basically uh, come out... Uh, you know, everyone else will probably be uh, no impact. But they do have some tax tips uh, if this happens, which is looking like it may. Um, basically, these guys in Congress can't get their act together and, and cooperate and make a deal. Over on makingwindowseasy.com, they're talking about Delicious trying again to uh, regain relevancy. And, uh, you know, Delicious was pretty popular for a while. The social bookmarking site... Uh, which was bought by uh, Yahoo and fell into the black hole. So many other of the services required by this church company. It appears Yahoo unloaded it. To, of course, you know, we know Yahoo unloaded it to the founders of YouTube. And uh, so now they're working on it. So you're going to want to see its demo. Let's see if I can bring it up here. All right. Uh, let me bring it up on this side over here. So those of you watching the video can see. So it basically shows you what's popular right now. Plus, you can add your own bookmarks in there. So uh, everything's tagged out. And I think this is cool. And again, I hope it's, again, part of being able to reclaim some of the web that we've lost. And uh, But yeah, Delicious is uh, working to make a comeback, which is uh, which is awesome. How about, you know, when you look in a mirror, take a picture of yourself in a mirror, what happens? The picture gets reversed, right? Um, you know, same thing. When you look in a mirror, the image you see is, as see of yourself as in reverse. But a new mirror invented by Drexel University mathematics professor Dr. R. Andrew Hicks shows you what your shows you your face without reversing its image. So this is pretty cool. He's been able to, to uh, come up with uh, a way to make the mirrors um, uh, work in a way that it, it's basically you're not reversed. So uh, this his reverse mirror is getting a, it's a lot of attention too. It's on display as part of the art exhibition, art exhibition in New York City. But uh, this guy's working on applications and figuring out the commercial impact here. But uh, this is cool. Be able to see yourself instead of being backwards, but the way you would normally um, in a mirror is, is really really cool. Hey, Warner Brothers has sued um, digital content production, excuse me, Warner's Brothers and Intel's daughter company, Digital Content Protection, have filed a lawsuit against a hardware manufacturer that created a device that enabled consumers to bypass HDCP copy protection. The device uh, was leaked uh, with the HDCP master key. And uh, so anyway, this is this is huge. Now, this is this was two years ago when the HDCP master key was cracked. And, uh, you know, the crack was Hollywood's worst nightmare as it opened an analog hole that allows everyone to copy digital video, including pay-per-view streams. So the developers of HDCP were also outraged and promised to crack down on abusers of the key. 
So one of the folks that put a box out, um, Freedom USA, which operates under the names of ABA Direct and Antares Pro, make several devices which allow consumers to convert HDCP encrypted digital signals to analog studio, studio signals. And uh, so this would allow them to record pay-per-view broadcasts, including Hollywood movies. Now, they are not happy about this company, and they're going after it in a big way. So we'll see. But if you want to get one of these devices, you better order it now before the door is closed. Final article tonight. Um, Kim.com is showing off the new Mega Rack. And it would be kind of, you know, it's kind of a little geek uh, porn here, folks. Um, of course, it's just a rack with hard drives in it. So um, 720 byte, 720 terabytes of data is what they've got uh, um, available on its initial rollout. And they say they can add many, many more. That cannot come cheap. You know, that's that's not a, that's not a inexpensive uh, piece of gear here, but they're scheduled to launch on January 19th. Again, exactly one year after Mega Upload was shut down. And um, so what's going to happen is, is that Mega is going to partner with hosting providers from all over the world to create a global cloud network. And again, how they're going to do this, and they expect to fill 20 petabytes of data per month, is that they are going to, everything that you send back and forth will be encrypted. There's not going to be anything that uh, it'll go up and there'll be safe harbors. They'll actually get safe harbors act because they won't be able to see what's gone up on their website because it's all encrypted. So we will see where this goes through, but they're going to say they're going to use military grade encryption. People use it to secure their files before a file is uploaded. And uh, so that's a pretty big claim that's saying they're using military grade encryption. So we'll see where this goes on January 19th when it launches. Let me check email here real quick and see what we've got in the stack tonight. See what came in. Let's see here on the 17th, anything after that. Oh, if you're a podcaster, um, iTunes podcast submission system will be offline from approximately December 21st through December 27th. No submitting of new podcasts. So, uh, you, well, you will be able to submit them, but, uh, new episodes and approvals are not going to, um, not going to happen. And they'll be back up to full speed on December 28th. Um, you know, fully expecting the, the, the big seasonal load that's, that's going to come in. So anyway, that kind of wraps me up here, folks, on the, uh, the show tonight. Again, we want you to feel free to, uh, to email us here. Uh, Twitter me at Geek News, emails geeknews at gmail.com, voicemail hotline 619-342-7365. Hey, I appreciate you hanging out with me here on the show. And uh, I'm really looking forward to having a couple of shows off. I need a little bit of a break. Um, so, you know, I, I appreciate you guys bearing with me as we head into the CES content. Um, again, no Christmas show, except we'll do the Insider that will happen on Christmas Eve that we'll out to our Insiders. And then we'll have one show next week um, on our normal Thursday time. And then it will be uh, really off to Vegas. And they're probably audio only programming the first of the week after the new year. But, uh, you know, there's lots to do between now and then and rechecking my list three or four times and making sure we're ready to, uh, to go to Vegas. But uh, it's been my pleasure to bring you the show tonight. A little shorter. Thanks so much for being here. And I want to wish everyone a, a Merry Christmas. And uh, enjoy your holiday. Take time with the families and, and really uh, enjoy your time. It's, uh, it's a good time of year just to kind of decompress and, uh, and hopefully not get too stressed out. But uh, thanks so much for being here tonight. And uh, we'll see you next week um, on the next a week from t basically one week from today. Until then, everyone take care. We'll see you next time. Aloha. <laughs>